So we're going to talk about objection handling today, today's world, today's market, different objections that we're getting, things along those lines, all that jazz, all that fun stuff. Maybe we'll learn a couple things today. Maybe we won't. We just don't know. But we're going to do our damnedest to find out. Okay, so somebody, let's start with this. Somebody give me an objection that you're getting out there. I'm ready. Okay, J Jason, go ahead. You know what, Robert? We, we, we were thinking about selling, but we're just going to wait for the market to crash now. Why would you wait for the market to crash to sell your house? Uh, that's a good question. I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other objections out there? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I've talked to a lot of other agents that I've been role-playing with too, and they're getting that, they're getting like, oh, we're just going to wait for the market to cool off. It's too hectic. I mean, they're like, that's I understand that if you're a buyer. Out. Well, a lot of <laughs> sellers are buyers. That's the thing. Okay. Most so you're are... selling a house and you need to buy a replacement property yes. and you want to wait for the market to cool down before you buy a replacement property. 100%. Okay, great. So other than the mark you're waiting for the market to cool down is there anything else that would hold you up from selling this house and buying a replacement property no okay so if we could come to an agreement that now might be a better time instead of waiting for the market to cool down you would list your house and purchase a replacement property honestly i think the, the i hear what you're saying i think the response we're going to get is <laughs> we're, we're out of the market now. We're, we're just going to wait. Call me in six months. Okay. So call me in six months because you think you want us, the market to cool down. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So I perfectly understand that. So Jason, let me ask you, first of all, the house that you're selling, are you moving up or moving down? Moving up. Okay. And the money that you're going to use for the down payment on your next house, is it coming from the proceeds of selling your current house? Indeed. <clears throat> okay. So is it fair to assume that if the market goes down on your replacement property, it's also going to go down on your property? Indeed. Okay. So if the price goes down on your property and you lose out on some equity, what does that mean you're also losing? Down payment money. My down payment money. Correct. So if you lose your down payment money and you can't get to the next property because of your down payment money, now you're stuck in this property for the foreseeable future. So let me ask you, are you okay staying in this property for the next few years or would you rather get into the bigger property now? And if anything changes in the market, at least you're in your bigger property, which would you prefer? Uh, I, I, honestly, I think the, 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 I hear you. But most people are going to say, I'm going to wait. They're going to wait. Okay. So, so you're okay staying in the smaller yep. property. We have no for, choice now. A, for a few years. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then Great. we move on. That's it. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask, well, no, I can keep, I can keep going. So Jason, let me ask you this. Why do you think the market's going to cool off? That's, yeah. uh, that's a great question. Uh, maybe within the next year. No, but why do you think it's going to cool off? Oh, uh, raising interest rates or the prices are just too damn high. Prices are too high, raising interest rates. Okay, got it. So let me ask you this. At the beginning of COVID, do you know what the interest rates were roughly? Two and a half, three? Two and a half percent. And where are they at now? Five and a half. Five and a half. So over the last two and a half years, the rates have steadily gone up 3%, correct? Yes, that's correct. What have prices been doing in the last two and Gone a half up. years? Okay, so is it fair to assume that rising interest rates doesn't necessarily mean lower prices? That's exactly right. Okay, great. So, so that kind of takes care of that. Now, you think the prices are just too damn high, right? Yeah, the prices okay, are going, yeah. great. So let me ask you a question, and I don't want you to be upset with me. Okay. Is prices being too high? Is that a fact or an opinion? That's an opinion. That's an opinion, right? Because all these homes that prices are too high are still selling, right? 
Like hotcakes, yeah. And some of them are selling for above list price. Yes, that's correct. Which means some people think the price is not too high. They actually think it's low and they're saying, I'll give you an extra 20 grand. Yeah. So, so Jason, based on that, we know that rising interest rates doesn't necessarily mean lower prices. And based on the fact that the general public does not think prices are too high, would you agree that we're maybe not looking at a slowdown? Yeah. Okay. So, and you really want to get into a bigger house, don't you? Yes, that's the idea. Great. Mm -hmm. So why don't we sell this house now, take your equity and get you into that bigger house before the rates go any higher and the prices go any higher? That sounds like a good plan. Okay, great. Cool. Okay. Questions on what I just did? Yeah, Robert, I have a question. Yes. Um, what if the um, objection is a little bit different and not, not necessarily priced, but how are you going to find me a property? I'm worried about even being able to find one. Forget about price. Okay, so so we agree before we talk about that, we agree on selling your property. We're good on the price, terms, commission, all that stuff, correct? Sure. Okay, great. Because if, if we can't even agree on that, then it doesn't really matter about the replacement property, right? True so we enough. always got to try to get that figured out first. Okay, great. But you're concerned about finding a replacement property. Got it. Well, actually, Carrie, I'm glad you bring that up because one of the reasons sellers like you who are buying replacement property work for me is there's actually 10 different things I do to help you find a replacement property. Do you mind if I go over those with you now? I would love to hear it. Okay, great. So obviously the first thing we're going to do is we're going to search the MLS for homes that fit your criteria. Sometimes we can find some great homes and sometimes we can't, okay, but we're going to do that. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find all the expired, new expired listings that fit your criteria. And I'm going to call those sellers and see if they would be interested in selling the property to you. I am not going to try to take their listing. I'm just calling to see if they work out a deal with you. And the third thing, I'm going to do the same thing with the new canceled listings. I'm going to do that because sometimes these people still want to sell their home. They just need a little extra push or a little bit, someone else to help them out. Does that make sense? Perfect. <clears throat> Great. The fourth thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing with all the old expireds. And then I'm going to do the same thing with all the old canceled listings over the last two to three years that fit your criteria. And then the sixth thing is I'm going to call all the for sale by owners that fit your search criteria. Again, not trying to get the listing, but simply seeing if I can work out a deal to help you find a property. We good so far? This is amazing. Okay. The seventh thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look up the trends in your neighborhood that you want to buy in and figure out what the average turnover rate. And let's say it's seven years. I'm going to find all the homes that have bought seven or more years ago that fit the type of home you're looking for. And I'm going to call those people to see if they're interested in selling their house. Okay. The eighth thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out to all the agents that have withdrawn listings because they're still under contract figure out what they're, see if they might still be interested in selling their house. Okay. And then the ninth thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out to every single person in my database because sometimes they know some off-market stuff and see if they might be open to selling their property. We good so far? Wow. Okay. So based on me doing all that, do you feel a little bit more comfortable about finding a replacement property? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, the, had and the, the final straw, Carrie, is I have never left an, a client homeless. So what we're going to do is make sure when we list your property that it's contingent upon you finding a replacement property so you have some protection. You good with that? This is great news. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and sign the contract. Can I borrow your pen? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So great question. So look at We... They, there are issues, right? Well, I can't find a property. I can't find a replacement property. I want you to write this down. If you're waiting for the MLS to solve your problem, you will continue to have a problem. Seller wants to buy a replacement property. Okay, great. You need to, this is where you earn your paycheck. Going on the MLS and searching for properties for a buyer is not earning your paycheck. Why? Why is that not earning a paycheck? That's really passive. Really passive. And the buyer has the same information available to them. 
they might not, they don't have the showing remarks, but they have the same property information because they can go to Redfin, Zillow, and all these other different things. So going to the MLS and saying, hey, I found this property. The buyer's looking at you going, so did I yesterday. <laughs> like you're not earning a paycheck doing that. You want to earn your paycheck. You got to take the next steps. And yes, the inventory is lower on the MLS for replacement properties. So you got to you got to find their search criteria and call the expired, call the canceled, call the old expires, the old cancels, the for sale by owners, the for rent by owners, the withdrawals, call your database, you figure it out. You got to get something going, call the top agents in the area and see if they have any off market listings. You got to take the necessary steps. Because if you don't do that, what do you lose? What else do you lose in that scenario? What would I have also lost? What would I have also lost? Money. Not money, but but what? What? How would I have gotten the money? What would I have lost if I couldn't get them to convince on the replacement property? Lose a listing. And I would have lost the listing. Now, we all agree that listings are very, very important. So are we okay losing a listing because we didn't want to take those necessary steps to help them find a replacement property? No way, man. No way, no how. So you need to be able to go through that. Great question, great question. And then actually do it. I know, now we're really getting crazy. <laughs> actually do those things. Okay, great. Give me, a, what else? What, give me another objection you're running into. Let me close my door. Come on, give me another objection. I already have an agent. You already have an agent. Are you a seller or a buyer or both? Uh, both. Okay, great. So you already have an agent to help you with the listing or the buying or both? Both. Both. Okay, great. Did you already sign a contract with them? No, not yet. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So Jason, I'm curious, this is obviously your biggest financial decision, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Can I share with you what a lot of people in your exact same situation have found to be invaluable? Sure, what's that? Well, see, smart people like yourself, before <laughs> they get tied up in a multi-month contract for thousands of dollars on their biggest financial investment, typically get a second opinion from a seasoned professional like myself, if for no other reason to make sure that their current agent has the right strategy, the right marketing plan, and the right plan of action to get their home sold. Now, if I went over all that with you in 15 minutes, would that be worth your time? Yeah, I think it would. Great. So why don't we do this? I, I don't mind. Let's just get together for a few minutes. I'll go over what my plan of action in that's got a proven system and a proven track record for success. Mm -hmm. And again, best case scenario, you and I can work something out. Worst case scenario, you at least know what questions to ask your friend before you get tied up in a contract with them. So would today or tomorrow at six o'clock work better? Excellent. Yeah. Does anybody recognize that script? <laughs> I'm just I think we had that on this morning. Yeah, yeah. Is it the I have a friend in the business? Well, yeah, he, he he said he already signed an agent. I could use that as I have a friend in the business. I already have an agent. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. I'm trying to do a second opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I could do now. Now let's 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 play this again. So Jason, did you already meet with that agent? Yeah, we have met with him. Okay, you already met with him. Okay, but you haven't signed yet. No. Okay, great. So. Now I could approach this a couple different ways. I'm going to do this a couple different ways. So you okay. have a few different strategies. Okay, great. So Jason, I'm curious. And I feel like anybody that's been what why didn't you sign? What what was missing from that agent that didn't give you the confidence to sign with them? Oh, I don't think they even had the contract with them. They just came by to see the house and we're gonna make another appointment with them. Oh, okay. So they just came by to see the house. They didn't even have a contract with them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, that's that's really interesting. You know, I would, you know, this, I, I don't want to, you know, sound intrusive here, but this, this is kind of a sales business. It's kind of interesting that they wouldn't have all that stuff prepared. You know, Jason, would you be open to meeting with me for 15 minutes just so I can show you a little bit different of what I do to get home sold, maybe in a little bit more structured manner than that agent might've had? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Okay, great. So I, I would try to figure out what that agent didn't even have. They didn't even have a contract, so I can slam that all day. Yeah. But let me take this another approach. Okay. So Jason, you already met with them. So 
can I ask you a couple really important questions just so you know if you have the right agent or not? Yeah. Okay, great. Did that agent give you a specific step-by-step -step plan of action of what they're going to do to get their home sold? Or did they kind of just do more vague statements like they're going to do a lot of marketing? Yeah, I wasn't real specific. No. Okay, great. So for your biggest financial asset, do you think it would be valuable if someone gave you an actual step-by-step -step plan of the exact actions they're going to do to get your home sold? Yeah, of course that would be helpful. And do you, would you find it very good if every Friday you got to call the agent and ask them what activities they did to hold them accountable? Yeah. Yeah. That would be pretty cool, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that's one of the things that I do with my with the people I work with. The second question I have is, did they give you a copy of their schedule? No. Okay. Okay. Can I tell you why that should concern you a little bit? Yeah, sure. Please. They probably don't have one. Uh huh. Now the good and the bad of our industry is we're independent hey, Virginia, contractors, Neil which Schwartz, means you can you? come and go as you please. Now I'm guessing you don't want your largest financial asset in the hands of someone that just kind of has a come and go as they please mentality, right? No, of course not. So if I gave you my structured schedule showing you what I'm doing every day, that would be a value, wouldn't it? Yeah, sure it would. Okay, great. And the third thing, Jason, is did they give you a list of all the affiliates involved in the transaction, the title, escrow, so you know who you're going to be dealing with on this transaction? Mm -mm, no, not yet. Would you, I mean, this is again, your largest financial transaction. Wouldn't it be nice to know who the escrow officer is, who the title rep is that's handling this for you? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Right. Yeah. So basically, Jason, as you can see, my system seems to be a little more structured than the agent you met with, correct? Yes, it seems. Okay, so I think we've at least come to the agreement that it's worth 15 minutes to meet with me to see what else I might do, right? Great. Great. So would today or tomorrow at four work better for you? Let's do tomorrow at four, yeah. Okay, great. So I got that objection and I handled it three different ways. Does everybody see what I'm doing here? Yeah. Okay. I, I got the, I already, I already have an agent. So I did that objection handler that we role play in the morning. Okay. I already have an agent. I attacked the, why didn't you interview them? That's the second option I can do. And the third option I can do is great. Let me ask you really important questions to make sure that you met with the right person. Okay. It's a few different ways. Questions on any of that. Hey, Robert, this is Michael. Yes. Yeah. I got a question. Look like right now, I mean, from, all these years that I'm working because there are not that many opportunities to get a listing. And there is so many agents, hungry agents, they want to get listings. The commission thing is one of the things that they put in the seller's mind. And so every time you prospect, they ask you, you know, how much you charge? And, and sometimes that is a trap because if you say a number, there's somebody else that will take advantage and will go lower. Sure. What do you suggest in this case? Because I know sometimes they want to get it from you. What, what do you charge? But if you say it, you know, the other agent is waiting for you to say that. So then he can beat you up, you know, and say, oh, I can do it for less than that. Okay. I don't know. It, ha right. it happens more in my, in my all my years working. It's happened now more than ever now. Okay, great. So, so let's assume that I've already done the, we'll go over that. And you say, well, just give me the commission. Uh, we can go over that when we get together, give the commission. Okay, great. So, Michael, look, and I'm happy to go over my commission with you on the phone, but can you make me a promise? Yes. So a, yes. Okay, great. I'm going to tell you my commission, and that's going to give you the opportunity to run to every other real estate agent you talk to and says, Robert charges this, which means they're going to try to charge you lower just to get the meeting. So no matter what I tell you, will you promise that you and I can get together for 15 minutes so I can go over what I do to help you get your home sold for the most amount of money? Oh, that sounds fair. Sure. Great. And, and I look at, I, I assume you're a man of your word. So I, I trust you on that. I charge 2.78%. That's my side. And then when we get together, we'll talk about the buyer side. Does that work? Okay. That sounds great. So, so, so we're still on for Tuesday at four o'clock, right? Yes, definitely. Great. I'll see you Thank Tuesday you. at four. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So if I can't get past it, because obviously we skipped a couple steps here for those of you that might be newer. They say, what's your commission? The initial act reaction is, you know what? That's a great question. When we get together Tuesday, we'll go over all of that, okay? But sometimes what Michael's saying is that they're pushing on you. No, 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 you gotta tell me, you gotta tell me because they might take whatever number I get, go run to other agents, says, well, Robert's charging two and a half, three 3%. The other agent says, that's crazy, I'll do it for one. And then I don't get the meeting. So 
I made it. I'm going to make Michael feel really guilty if he cancels on me. Okay. So make me a promise. He said, yes. And I said, now you seem like a man of your word. So I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So now if he says, oh my gosh, well, I'm not going to do that. He looks like a jackass. Now, luckily we know Michael and he's not one of those, but in those, I'm talking about the type of people out there. Okay. But I can control it in that particular way. Questions on that. Is this helping anybody what I'm doing right now? Yes. Huge. Yes. 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 Okay. yes, it is. Good, 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 good. Okay. I'm trying to write. I don't write that fast. So this is recorded, right? <laughs> I hope so. Because I, I hope so. Yes, this is. I made sure to record this and we're going to get this one uploaded um, quickly because I want to make sure everybody has this. Okay. Give me another one. I got one for you, Robert. Yes, Carrie. Robert, I've been looking and looking and looking, and I've been on the internet looking around, and I'm waiting for the bubble. I'm waiting for the bubble. Everyone says it's coming. Who's everyone? Oh, the internet. You know, I was on these all these sites, and I saw I saw all these sites, and it's out there. It's coming. Everyone says yeah. it's coming. Okay, so the real estate bubble is coming. All right, so Carrie, let me ask you this: if if we come to an agreement that there's no bubble coming, are, is there anything else holding you up from buying a property right now? No, I'm ready to go, but I know that bubble's coming. Okay, coming. so okay. so really, if we can come to an agreement on the bubble coming or not coming, you're ready to write up aggressive offers. Yes? Absolutely. Okay, great. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, so you're reading on the internet that the bubble is coming. Every day. Every day, every day. Five times a day, I read. Five it. times coming. a day, bubbles coming. Okay, great. Now, why? Let's narrow this down here, though, because I like to take things to the most basic common knowledge because I'm just not that smart. So, Carrie, what are these sites saying as to why there's a bubble coming? They're saying it's just like the bubble from 2008. It's all going to happen 2008. Again. Okay. It's just like the bubble from 2008 where prices were here and there was a global economic collapse and then everything tanked, right? So that's what you're reading. Okay. okay. Right. That's and Ukraine's going to make it worse. Ukraine's going to make it worse. Sure. Sure, 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 sure. Yes, I know. Yeah, you know, Ukraine's going to make it worse and all these other different things. Yes. Now, no, the internet is full of wonderful information. Okay. So- Carrie, can, can we talk about the difference between now and 2008? So in 2008, were you around in real estate in 2008 or at least around real estate lingo in 2008? Oh, well, I was alive in 2008. Okay. And All I, right. I just want to make sure. Of, so the people, the people buying homes in 2008 and the previous years, were they getting qualified loans or was everybody getting a loan? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so everybody was getting a loan. Stated income, stated assets, 100% financing. Carrie, would you believe that there was actually a loan program called a pay option arm where you could actually make less than an interest only payment, which made your mortgage higher than the actual value up to 125%? That's pretty crazy, right? I did not know that. Right. So now you have all these people buying homes that they don't afford. And that's what led to this massive problem. So have lending, do you know if lending guidelines have been stricter since 2008? Yeah, there was some information on the internet about that. All right, good. So the internet's also providing that information. Yes, lending guidelines have been much stricter. Therefore, the people that are buying homes over the last 10 years actually qualify for the home. Now, have home prices been going up or down over the last 10 years? Way up. Way up. So now you have people qualified to buy the home and values going up. So they have some, some equity in there. Interest rates are still incredibly low. So therefore, that's a little bit different than the bubble because they're actually qualifying for the payment. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. So now we've overcome the bubble talk, right? That it's not going to be that. I mean, I guess if you say it's not coming. Okay, great, 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 great. So it's a little bit different from 2008 to, to now, right? So there you go. Now, 
Now they could also say the bubble's coming, prices are too high, things are gonna collapse just like they did in 2008, of which I would just go back to what I did with Jason and I would ask them, hey, great, are prices too high? Is that an opinion or is that a fact? Of which they will say that is an opinion. Because this is really important for everyone to understand. Prices to a price being too high is only a fact if nobody in the world is willing to pay it. If one person is willing to pay for something, that by definition means the price is not too high. And we are in a real estate market where homes are selling off the market like that. There's still very little expired. And therefore, prices being too high is an opinion. The people buying properties do not think the prices are too high because we're still getting multiple offers and a lot of cases above ask price. So think about that concept of the objection I used with Jason that I could use here with Carrie as well. There are some people, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, that actually think the price is still low because they're willing to pay 10, 15, $20,000 above it. They're willing to say, your price is too low. Here's more money. That's how much an opinion of prices being too high is. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Come on, give me more. What else you got? We aren't quite ready. We need to finish a couple of projects around the house before we put it on the market. Okay, I can't do anything about that. <laughs> okay, what kind of, all right, let's see what we can do. Other than the projects, Armin, is there anything else holding you up from listing your property? No. Okay. What kind of projects are you doing? Uh, painting, flooring, windows, stuff like that. Okay. So you're doing like a, a remodel for the most part, flooring and stuff like that. Mm, yeah. Okay. Painting, because like painting mm -hmm. you can do on a weekend. Flooring, right. that's a couple months. So let me ask you, are you doing the flooring because it's going to generate more value or you're doing the flooring because the house is not really livable with the current flooring? It's, it's ugly and dirty. It's just, it makes it look raunchy. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, why don't we do this? Let's get together for 15 minutes. Let me take a look. And I will give you my opinion on if I think that the flooring is going to be worth the investment, or if you might just be better off selling it as is. Does that work for you? Yes. Okay. Cause I don't want you to, I don't want you to spend 50 grand if it's only going to get you 20 value, 20,000 in value. So how about today or tomorrow at four o'clock? Tomorrow, four o'clock. Great. That's a tough one. It's a great question, Armin. That's a tough one because if it's a situation where the house is a mess and, in, and what Armin's saying is that the, it's dirty, it makes it look raunchy or whatever. I forget the word that he said. That's tough because it might be worth it to do the flooring, which is going to take a little bit of time. But what I'm going to do is get in the game and get there to see it because, you know, he might think that the, the flooring is ugly. And I might look at it and go, let's just mop it and sell it. And you won't have to spend a dime or anything and you'll still get great value out of it. So I, I got to get to see the house first before they spend any money. Good question. That, but that's a tough one because if it's if they need to remodel it, then that, that could be a real thing. Can I, can I tell you what I said? Yes. I said, fantastic, Robert. I can appreciate you getting the property so ready. And in today's market, you know that it's really a beauty contest and a price war, right? Right. But let me ask you this. Do you complete a project faster with a deadline or without a deadline? With, with a deadline. With a deadline. So how much time do you need to finish those couple of things around the house? Uh, the flooring, the contractor said the flooring is going to take about three months. Three months. To get, the, to, get yes. the, to, get the, to get all the product and get everything done. Three months. Well, in my case, she said two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, great, let's do this. Why don't we go ahead and pick a target date, complete the contract now. Then while you're finishing your projects for the next week to 21 days, we can go ahead and get ready with all the paperwork. We can simply hit go and we can have buyers waiting when we're ready to put the house in the market. That's, that's the answer. She that's the that's answer. pure gold right there. Pure that, gold. That, that's the answer. That's it. That's the answer. Anytime someone is pushing, pushing off on, you know, well, I want to wait, you know, give me a couple of weeks, give me a month, get the contract signed. 
Get the contract signed. Okay. Let me ask you this. Even if they're two months away, three months away, in today's market, if the home is priced correctly, how long will it stay on the market? Give me a number. Five to 10 days. Five to 10 days. Okay, great. So if I sign a six month contract and it takes them three months for the house to get on the market, it still gets me three months to get it sold, right? If it's priced correctly, I don't have a problem. But what I do and what Armin's doing here is I'm blocking cousin Ricky from coming in and taking the listing. Because those of you that have been around me for any period of time, my biggest fear, and I have no proof to know if this actually happens, but this is my fear, is that we, is that we have a lead and then the seller finds out that cousin Ricky has a real estate license. And then we follow up and they say, well, now I'm going to listen with my cousin. He's going to do it for a half a percent, so and so forth. Get the contract signed. Now, here's the other thing to what Armin said. Make it seem like you're going to do a whole bunch of stuff to make it worth it. Well, why would I get it signed now? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, because this is going to give me time to get my marketing ready, get my signs ordered, schedule the photographer, get all these things ready to go. So that way, when you're, as Armin said, when you're ready to go, we hit go day one, we're on the market. If we wait and then this gets completed, then we have to start this process. And now we're not on the market for another three, four weeks. Okay. Another, another thing, if it's, if it's good on the exterior, maybe you can put it as coming soon and start getting you to work. Um, there you go. Maybe calling people around, the door knocking and getting it ready. When it's ready, it's basically your data, a lot of marketing already. There you go. Eddie's right. Eddie's right. Hey, I have a quick question. Does anybody know what I'm doing at the very beginning of these objections that you all are sending me? Has anyone caught on to what I've, what I've done on every single one of these? You ask right. questions. Box, box them in. I box them in every single time. And it's open-ended questions. Well, I, I, but yes, thank you, Ernest, for, for finding that. And Armin, same thing. I box, I'm boxing them in every single time. Okay. Other than this, is there any other reason you wouldn't buy? Other than this, is there any other reason you're saying every single time? That's what I've done. Okay. All right. What else? What else you got? We got time for a few more. Robert, I was listening to my podcast this morning and there were two buyers who called into the podcast saying the foreclosures are coming. I'm not going to sell my house until the foreclosures start hitting the market because I want to get a deal. So you're not going to buy a house until the foreclosures hit the market. Okay, Correct. Great. Yeah, they're waiting for a deal. They know that they've been paying their mortgage, but nobody else on the planet's been paying their mortgage because of the COVID. And they know that there's hundreds and hundreds of foreclosures coming. Okay. Got it. So Carrie, other than that, is there any other reason that you would be waiting to buy a house? Ooh, Robert, don't box me in. <laughs> okay. Well, no, so but let's, there, you let's, know, assume, no let's assume that she says yes. No, I, I, I just want to wait for the foreclosures to happen. Okay, great. I understand. You want to wait for the foreclosures to happen. And you think it's because all these people haven't been paying their mortgage, correct? Oh, yeah. That's what the internet says. Okay. Well, that, that, that's fine. So- Carrie, let me ask you, over the last, forget 10 years, five years even, have home prices been going up or down? Way up. Okay, so is it fair to assume that pretty much everybody has equity in their home for the most part? Sure, I guess so. Okay, great. So if somebody has equity in their home, why would they let it go to foreclosure when they could just sell it and make a profit? Sure. The internet says everyone's behind though. The foreclosure. Okay. That's coming. fine. But do you understand that, that since they have equity, they, they, they could just sell it. It won't go to foreclosure. Right. So, so therefore we're not really going to have a lot of foreclosures because somebody could just sell the property. So a foreclosure is when somebody is underwater and then they just let the bank keep it. So, but let's, so let's now assume that, okay, great, but they're behind on their mortgage. So they're going to still sell the property, which is going to lead to a lot of equity or a lot of listings, correct? Correct. Okay, great. And the internet is saying that there's hundreds of thousands of people behind on their mortgage, correct? Okay. Oh, yeah, everyone. And, and, and that's a national number, correct? Uh, it was a national podcast, so probably, yeah. I guess. Okay, great. So if it's a hundred, hundreds of thousands nationally, 
Would you agree that in Long Beach, the number is really not that high? Oh, well, that would make sense, I guess. Yeah. Okay, great. Because nationally is big. <laughs> okay. So, so really, there's not a lot of people behind on their mortgage. Now, the other thing is when the banks did a lot of foreclosures in 2008, how did that work out for everybody? I don't know. I didn't buy a house then. Okay, but you do remember the global global economic collapse that happened in 2008? Sure thing. Okay, great. So being that there was a global economic collapse when banks foreclosed on properties, do you think they're in a rush to do that again? Oh, I guess not. I didn't think about that. Probably not. So it's probably, the banks are probably going to do everything they can to help these people. Wouldn't you agree? So no foreclosures? So no foreclosures, correct. Okay. Now, but here's the other thing. Let's take it one step further. Let's take it one step further. Let's say that in the city of Long Beach, there it does lead to some listings and it leads to over the next six months, leads to 60 more listings on the market, 10 more listings a month, covering all price ranges just in your city. 10 listings a month covering all price ranges in your city. Is that going to solve the price and inventory problem? Not likely. Not likely. So therefore, it doesn't seem like waiting for these so-called foreclosures. It makes a lot of sense. Would you agree? Wow. Well, when you say it like that, yeah. Right. You know, you know, what, you know what really could cause a problem, though, is the interest rates could still be going up, which means you could be priced out even further. You don't want that, do you? Nice segue, Robert. Nice yeah, job. Yeah. So how about, would you like to go see homes today or tomorrow at four? Today, please. Great. Let's go see homes today at four. That was a good objection. Anyone, any questions on any of that? This is a really important one. If you weren't around in 2008, it doesn't matter. I mean, not, not how you were alive, but if you don't understand what happened in 2008, it's not important. Here's what you need to know. In 2008, the banks foreclosed on a ton of homes. That led to a global economic collapse where prices got cut by half. Towns went away. Homes were totally shut down, demolished. I mean, it was a disaster of what happened in 2008, okay? Big banks got shut down. We might've heard the, the saying, too big to fail, where the government had to pour in $700 billion to save banks, okay? Lehman Brothers, gone. Bear Stearns, gone. Like all, It was a massive ordeal for those of you that weren't or either too young or don't really remember it, okay? It was a big deal. Therefore, you have to ask yourself, do you think the banks are in any rush to repeat that process? No, <laughs> no, they're not going to go, hey, you know what? All these people are behind. We're foreclosing on people. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. I have. Does anybody remember 2008? Oh, you're right. Never mind. Let's not do that. They're going to do everything they can to try to help people figure this out because they're not going to go through that again. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody understand that concept, right? The other part of that is, because I, because I, Carrie mentioned this, but I, I hear this all the time. Well, I read that there's hundreds of thousands of people behind on their mortgage. Well, that's nationally. That's 50 states. So if I took hundreds of thousands of people in a 300 million population country, and I condense that down to the city they want to buy, what are we talking about here? A few homes? Well, Robert, you know, it could be 50 homes in my marketplace. Okay, great. Across all the price ranges. See, a buyer thinks, well, it could be 50 listings at 600,000, three bedrooms, two bathrooms with a pool, one story. No, it's not going to be 50 listings at your price range, at your type of a house. It's going to be 50 homes across all price ranges, across every part of the city which means for your price range and your part of the city, we're talking about a couple homes. You've got people overbidding. You've got 10 offers on every property and you think a couple homes is gonna magically solve this problem? No, okay. 
but you have to break it down that way because to Carrie's point, and there's a lot of buyers, this, but I read this and I, and I think I heard the foreclosures, which means I have all kinds of options coming to me. Oh, even if there were foreclosures, we're talking about a couple homes per area across all price ranges. It's not going to solve their problem. Hey, Robert. Yes, Michael. Uh, the, the best answer that I heard for the difference between 2008, which I was here and, and you were here too, is that in 2008, the 30% of the market that really suffered all those foreclosures has zero equity. They right. over, you know, encumber. There was no way they, they were, that's why the short sales become so popular because they were owing more money than actually they were worth it. The main difference, just in last year alone, many homeowners make over a hundred thousand dollars in equity just in one year right so can you imagine all the equity the people has comparing with 2008 that they don't have so that's why before they go into foreclosure they have some money there they can spend right and and, and that's and that's that's the exact point and that's what i was getting across there is they're not going to foreclose because they have equity they'll just sell it they're not going to let the banks take it They'll sell it and make a ton of profit off of it. A foreclosure happens when they don't have any equity and then they just give it back to the bank. They're not going to do that when they're sitting on, as Michael points, $100,000, $200,000 to make. They'll just sell it, which again, but then they could say, great, then all these people are going to sell. And then we go back to what I just talked about. All right. Questions on any of the stuff we went over today? Okay. Other than this was great, man. I really thought this was a different way of looking at different things, and it really is a good eye opener. And yeah, I'm a pain in the butt thing. Uh, <clears throat> what you call it? A uh, product of 2008. So I definitely remember that time. So <laughs> yeah, different, different, different world, different world. Good, 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 good. Hey, Robert, it's Ignacio. How you doing, buddy? Good, buddy. Good, good. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you brought this, this, uh, this type of a, a meeting up today because it's very important in today's marketplace um, for us to understand what we need to improve on. And, you know, we, we have the other meetings where you guys can buy guests and whatnot, and it really helps us out. But I, I think that this is something that we really have to start doing, practicing handling objections more than ever before because it's really going to improve, you know, the game on us. And, yep. um, and thank you for that. It was it was very valuable that you bring this up today. Uh, thank you. Is one good. To, I'm to glad. Look, it. I'm just glad you're here. Because I could do this by myself, but it's not as much fun. <laughs> I'm always here. I'm just on mute. <laughs> I know. No, I, I see you. I see you. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Well, I'm glad this was helpful. I'm glad this was helpful because despite what some of you may agree, I don't do this for my ego. Okay. I get that uh, sometimes when I do this objection handling, no, it's an ego boost. I don't really care. I'm here what? to help you. I know. I know Armin. People think that's what I think about, but it's not. Hey, hey, Robert, but here, here's uh, what I, hold on, hold on one second, Michael, but here's what I, what I, I hope you got a couple things out of this. Okay. I hope you got a couple things out of it in terms of objections, but here's what I really hope you got out of that was you did, I didn't know the objections that you were going to send me. I didn't know. I opened it up to everyone else. Did I seem caught off guard? Did I seem worried? Did I um and ah and all those other different things when you were giving me these objections? No, 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 no. I didn't. Now, here's the thing. I'm not, as Neil Schwartz says all the time, there's nothing special about special people. Okay. This is just, I practice, I role play with you all, all the time. And I put this stuff into action, which means there is no reason why we couldn't do a class and you are in my position and have people just firing whatever they want at you. And you just go, let's go. I perfectly was ready to go today going, whatever they throw at me, I'm perfectly fine with. And I did a box in every single time. And I asked questions every single time. And I closed every single time. That, if nothing else, I hope you got out of it going, I need to be able to do what he just did. And if someone wants to just fire whatever they want at me, I can handle it. 
So I hope you got that out of that. And I didn't say, and I know for a fact, I didn't say, um, once. Hey, Robert, uh, this one, this one was one of the best classes you have. I tell you, I just go, going back to what I said before, right when people say, when people said, I'm going to wait until the listings are coming. One of the best things to do it is because people thinking they're going to wait for deals. And, and then you just ask a simple question. Are you going to be online? Do you know how many investors and people are waiting for deals? What part of the line are you going to be? And they say, oh, I thought they were waiting for me only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used, to, I used to always tell them, whenever somebody would say, <laughs> whenever somebody says they're looking for a deal, my first question is, well, what's a deal to you? Because I want to know what their deal is. But they say, whenever to Michael's point, they say, you know, well, I want something 10% below market value. Okay, great. Can I be honest with you? Sure. If I find a property 10% below market value, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so that property don't exist. All right. So, and to Michael's point, yeah, because you'll be the only one that knows about it and there will be no offers on it. No one else will try to jump on a property 10% below market value. There you go. All right. Very good. Well, good. I'm glad this was helpful. Let me stop the recording.